So, good evening, uh, everyone, and uh, welcome at this uh, online Q&A session in which we put attention from the uh, filmmakers who have short films in our Go Short Online Hub, the uh, VOD alternative to our physical festival, which we unfortunately had to cancel. Um, we as a festival find it very important to put the filmmakers behind the films in the spotlights and give them the opportunity to present their films, um, answer questions about it, and also as such get in contact with the audience. And as this was not possible physically now, I'm very, very happy we were able to organize an online festival as we have now and also added with um, several online Q&A sessions during uh, the last week actually of the online festival because it takes place until the 13th of, uh, of May. I uh, deeply hope everyone is fine, healthy and isn't affected too much by the current situation. Um, my name is uh, Teun van Laak and I am one of the programmers at Go Short. And for now, I will be moderating the sessions in which we have four guests who represent uh, three films. Uh, and you see them now. Hello, everybody. Hi. Hello. Um, this, uh, in this program, actually, it, the, the program has been changed a little bit uh, last minute because of uh, a cancellation. So it might differ from uh, earlier information which was provided. First, we will uh, talk about Seahorse um, with Natalie Bruins and Rivka Lodijzen, uh, respectively the director and lead actress of the film Seahorse. After that, we will talk with Ugo Petronin, and I hope I pronounced that well. Perfect. Director of the film uh, Abiding. And uh, we conclude with Marit Weerheim, director of En Route. Again, hello everyone, and I'm very happy to have you here and taking also the time uh, to get online with us and answer our questions. Uh, before we dive into the films head first, I have a few points to make. Um, I actually assume you watched the films because we're going really in depth into the films. So there might be some spoiler. If you've not seen the films, get your bottom up to the hub and see the films. Um, but for now, I hope you saw them so we can really talk about the, the films as they are. Um, in addition, I would like to say that you, the viewer, also have the possibility to ask questions. And this is possible in the comment section at the Facebook stream. And I will check this frequently to see the questions. Um, and lastly, this session will be recorded and published also afterwards in the platform. So if you see the film afterwards, you can check this Q&A session again. So let's meet the people behind the films. We start off with Seahorse, which was selected for uh, the Dutch competition at Go Short, which is selected, of course. Um, and again, we have Natalie Bruins, director, and Rivka Lodijzen, uh, the lead, uh, who plays the lead character in the film. And in this film, we follow Dana, who decided to go to an abortion clinic and enter pregnancy. Once inside, she sort of wavers between determination and the desire to experience every moment with full awareness. Um, and as such, we follow uh, her internal journey in the last moments before the actual moment of aborting. Um, before we start the q and I would like to uh, show you an excerpt so we have some kind of idea of the film. So let's watch that and then we get back to you. Ja, 
Thanks. So, hello again. Um, maybe Natalie, would you maybe start by telling us a little bit about the um, the coming up of the idea for this film and why you wanted to make this film about um, having an abortion, actually. Mm -hmm. Uh, hi, thanks for having me and having this, by the way. Um, I guess I'm very interested in the story that we tell ourselves uh, by making choices and what leads us to make certain choices in our lives. Um, and I guess also the need that we have in stories to, to survive certain choices. So, and I guess, when is a decision being made, which is in an abortion kind of a critic moment. So when do you decide? Do you decide when you go there? Is this a decision made after the abortion? Is it, when, when is the this decision moment in, in, on such a day? Uh, that, that was interesting to me. Um, uh, also, I went through one. <laughs> so oh, wow. it made it even more interesting to, uh, to, to investigate that subject. Yeah. Like, but then I can also imagine that it's quite, it was quite a, a, a difficult or hard process making this film. Is that so? Um, no, I mean it was money-wise, <laughs> but uh, no, it was no, it was uh, it, it was good. It was it was just uh, it was it made it even sharper. Uh, uh, it made the subject sharper because mm -hmm. I guess uh, mm -hmm. I knew what this uh, choice research is because it's something. I, I, I felt myself. So when exactly is a decision made? Uh, what does it mean to make certain decisions? Are some decisions impossible? Maybe sometimes we don't make a decision, but we think we made a decision and we have to tell ourselves, I made this decision because, uh, and that's an interesting subject to me, I guess. And, and uh, Rivka, when, when were you involved in this film and what was maybe your first reaction also on the script, or how did it go, the, the casting, actually? Um, Natalie and I are um, actually good friends. Um, so I knew she was writing a film uh, about um, an abortion. And um, there was a moment where uh, first she um, asked me to read the script. And um, actually, immediately after that, she asked me to play the part. And um, because it's, um, I think it's a really interesting subject and it was really well written. So um, I immediately felt um, fear <laughs> that uh, I, I wouldn't uh, do it good enough because I know Natalie so well. <clears throat> mm. And um, I know this was really, um, the process is really um, mm, subtle. Um, uh, and I also knew I had to uh, play her in a, in a way and I had to play myself because she wrote it um, for me. So there was, um, I, uh, yeah, I was really excited. <laughs> and and in how did you um, surpass this fear for this role then? I have this fear always, always. so I know how, I just, I just do it. It's like the choices that uh, Natalie means, yeah. yeah. Just say yes, and then uh, you're in it, and then you have to. <laughs> and and um, so did I um, understood you well also, Natalie, that you actually had Rivka in your mind already when writing the script? Yeah, yeah, correct. Uh, thinking of a character that would really uh, dare to sit somewhere not knowing and observe and yeah, I, I thought of I thought of her. Yeah, yeah. While, while I was writing it. Yeah. Uh, so it's funny because I wrote I, I wrote a character which is based on something I went through, but I wanted the character to be the person as much as I could to be as close to who Rivka really is. So I wrote her a character that had to be close to who she is, which is based on me. I don't know. It's a Kaufman situation. <laughs> <laughs> And um, I think I read somewhere that you really wanted to have this film shot at a real abortion clinic, but it was kind of difficult finding it. 
Can you maybe elaborate a little bit on that? Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I wanted to shoot it uh, in an abortion clinic because it's, it's such a specific uh, uh, place, I guess, and it's really built for that. Unfortunately, uh, they couldn't, they really wanted, because they thought it was an important film, Abortus Clinique Amsterdam, they, they wanted the film to happen, but they could not allow themselves to, to expose themselves in the media because there are still, unfortunately, bad reactions to abortions and they were afraid uh, that being connected uh, to the media somehow uh, would not protect their patients, which I completely uh, understood. So we looked for a different location and uh, yeah, that, that was strange because it, it, that, that I couldn't film it at the abortion clinic, I under, understood, but we couldn't find hardly any clinic that would, uh, that would help us with this uh, uh, subject. So I was quite surprised that in, in Holland, such a yeah. free country, I, I stumbled into a lot of people when they heard what, what the film is about, because when I come with the film and, and actors, everyone is interested. And then suddenly I say the word abortion and they say, well, I'm sorry, I'm afraid we can't help you with this. So that was surprising. Um, I ended up filming in a Turkish hospital. <laughs> and, but how did that happen? Did they did they came to you or how? how no, did they happen? said they said yes. They were the only ones that said yes. Oh wow! Yeah, that's that's rather interesting, actually. Such uh, yeah. development, yeah. Hmm. So and um, I I still find it interesting that you were so committed to having it filmed at a real location, whereas well, I I as a not really no. I don't know much about filming and, 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 and what you want as a filmmaker. So I'm interested in your urge to having it filmed in a real location and not, for example, in a, um, in a, in a, a fake built studio design thing. So I, I would like to know your, your objectives on that. Um, yeah, the, that specific place just had a kind of structure to it that, that I mean, of course, I could rebuild it completely if I had the budget to do so. Uh, it's important to say as well, there was no, not really a budget to build something. So we say I had the choice, but it's not really, if, if I could rebuild the abortion clinic, maybe I would do that. But the, the problem is with every other place is that they just have a specific, yeah, it has a specific uh, uh, setting. I guess, and it has specific, yeah. So there was a window behind you, but the window is 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 blank, is, is like white. So you see shadows uh, go by. So you feel there is an outside, but you're sitting with these women. So you're inside this this. Uh, it's really a surreal a surreal arena, which I which I liked. Yeah. Did but you we, also uh, feel that? So that coming, uh, sorry. I'm sorry. Oh, I was wondering if Rivka also felt this. Um, uh, no, I, I was aware that Natalie was really specific about uh, the, these um, uh, settings and, and uh, uh, actually the production design and the light. Um, but of course, it wasn't my experience. So I, I was just I, I, I was just put there and <laughs> I, I tried to be um, um, Dana. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. So I'm, I'm just going to have a quick check. As far as I can see, there are no questions yet. So I was wondering maybe, um, Rivka, if you could... I mean, I know you from, from the, the, the feature films and also bigger uh, Dutch series. How is it now for you to be also involved in a short film? Is there actually a difference? Um, um, I don't know. How, how is that for you? For me, the, there is no difference um, between a short uh, or a feature or... Um, I think, yeah, we didn't have like 30 shooting days. We had only four. And, um, so maybe, um, yeah, you, ha you have to work hard to, to make it, um, to make that happen and um, and, uh, Natalie really knew what she wanted. Uh, I was really surprised by her um, directing. She was really, really um, good. <laughs> um, um, no, there is for me. There's no difference. A character is a character, and and the development uh, character development is the same um, because we knew each other um, that well. I was. 
um, a bit nervous um, if, if, if I was doing okay, because there wasn't much time to really um, talk between the, the, the shooting. Um, yeah, I was a bit more insecure, maybe. No, I'm always insecure, sorry. <laughs> Can I ask a question? Yeah, of course. <laughs> did, you, did you work together before? Yes, we know each other from the set, from, the, from, a, from a film set in, in Norway for Dweine. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah, okay. <laughs> I know that one. <laughs> so, yeah. So I, I have a question. Mm -hmm. um, who is the lady in the beginning of the film? Uh, laying uh, in the bed um, when uh, I think she means when mm -hmm. Dana enters the clinic. There's a finger. Yeah. Plus. You want to answer, Rivka, or the lady lying in the bed with you? You see the eyes? Is that the? I think they mean Suzanne Bogart, the sleeping lady. That did you see in in the beginning, right? The first lady you see when you enter the clinic, I assume. Yeah. That oh yeah. That's Suzanne. That's Suzanne Bogart. Uh, that is uh, and, and a Dutch actress, um, which I also really like. And we try to make her seem as much as we can like Rivka, so that it would feel like she is maybe looking at herself or what she's about to uh, go through. And it, but eventually, how do they relate? Do they relate to each other? I think also is the question. Uh, both of them go to the clinic or yeah <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. well is it a, a question from the audience yeah yeah yeah. because um they they um she says they both say hi hi uh how are you so it um it's like a normal conf uh, conversation uh like when you you know each other and yeah. that's what makes it weird but mm. um they don't it's just yeah. Yeah, Dana. I guess she walks to she walks out to a lady and she says, "You called me," but she just wants to come close. She wants to watch her, and that's that's I guess my way of of, of introducing the character is that she goes by a bed that someone that she doesn't know, and she just stands over and she looks. Ah. And uh, yeah, that's the person you're gonna see in the film. So that's I guess and it's sort of introduction. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. Um, Can I ask another question? <laughs> yes, yeah. in the back. Okay. Um, so I was wondering if you uh, are willing to explain the title and the ending, because I have my own theory, but um, I'm wondering what your uh, what you wanted to say with the the title Seahorse and with the the final images. Mm. Uh, I don't know Maybe if don't I, gonna, explain, yeah, I don't know if explain. I guess uh, I guess she explains it as well in the film. Uh, uh, so what I said about choices and that we we make stories to explain our choices is that and everyone needs a story. And I guess Dana is going through an abortion, and Seahorse is her story to understand her choice. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so that's why if it's it, it, it's it's the it's the way she goes through the day. She it, she looks at a picture. It looks like a seahorse, and then she she has a story. I guess she needs that for herself. Yeah, yeah. I have one. I actually have more. Uh, another question. Um, that's nice. Yeah, it's really nice, but it's it's kind of difficult to sort of make a succinct um, highlight of it. So I'm just going to read it out loud. <laughs> um, I'm curious how Natalie, Natalie wrote the script for Rivka. Um, I love uh, Rivka's introvert way of acting, if I may call it like that, <laughs> between brackets, and, and how she always appears so natural on screen. This subtle clumsiness, her honesty, so raw and sincere. So um how did you have uh natalie as the lead actor when writing uh the script i guess is the question i'm curious how natalie wrote the script for rivka can you how how i wrote the script so that dana would feel like rivka yeah maybe yeah um I guess my, I guess the the first thing that I did without noticing is putting small words that that I know from Rivka in the character before the character was there, 
So that's uh, when she says, uh huh, or, or stop order. I don't know how you say it. Yeah. In, mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> to start with, with small gestures, I guess, small gestures that, that I know from Rivka. Um, uh, I, I put it in Dana, and that, and that was a, a good beginning for me. And I don't know. I think Rivka is really an observer. So it's it, if you see the film, Dana it doesn't even do that much. She she looks at other women, but 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 I see the way Rivka sometimes ob observes people, situations. She can be very quiet and she can sit there, but she is like scanning. There's a zoom zoom. She's scanning the <laughs> whole room, and 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 she and and it goes in. Um, she doesn't have to do anything for that, but that's. That that's Rivka. That's what you see. That 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 I see in Rivka, and that's what I thought she is. She would go in this room and she would look and observe. Uh, yeah. yeah, the absurd, the absurdity, I guess. That that's really interesting. Actually, mm -hmm. um, I have one one other question, which says, "What does the apple represent?" <laughs> The apple is from Adam and Eve. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> the apple, um, it represents uh, nothing. When you are waking up from, uh, you're not allowed to drink or eat for one hour. Uh, and at the clinic, when they, after they wake you up and you're a little bit more uh, awake and you can drink some tea or you can eat something. And usually your mouth is really dry and you really want to drink or eat something. And this, I guess this bite of an apple was something I wanted in the film. All right, thank you very much. And also thanks yeah. for the question, whoever it is. Yeah. Um, I was also wondering about the, um, I'm, I'm always when I see films and, and they're in your film, it starts off with a, uh, an ultrasound scan of a pregnancy. Yeah. And I was wondering, is this stock material? Is this a real scan? It's Maybe. a real scan. Yeah, mm -hmm. someone, somebody uh, uh, gave uh, uh, gave us her scan. We asked her. Oh wow! Uh, yeah, not of her abortion, <laughs> of her of her born baby, <laughs> but uh, yeah. So we we found one online, and then we contacted uh, the the person that put it, and then we said we are making a film. Can we use it? And the baby is born. Baby's no. born, yeah. Okay. yeah. It's a okay. Belgium, it's a Belgium baby. He's alive and very healthy. <laughs> That's great. Okay. Um, so I think we have more. We have to conclude this more or less because we have two other films. But thank you very, very much for uh, answering our questions and being available uh, for this. Thank you. Um, well, see you next time. We go ahead. Mm -hmm. Um, next uh, film we're, we're going to talk about is uh, Abiding by Ugo Petronin. Um, it's a five minute short film created from a single 32 millimeter photograph. And it was taken from, uh, from a train window between Dordrecht and Rotterdam. Was it? Yes. Okay. And um, let's watch an excerpt so we know what we more or less talk about. Um, I have a little warning because the the film has no sound at all. Something we're going to talk about later, I guess. Uh, so if you don't hear anything, it's not uh, because of uh, your speakers don't work. It, there's just no music. Okay, let's uh, watch the excerpt. Uh, so, uh, Ugo, 
Can you please um, start maybe by telling a little bit about your background? Because uh, I, as far as I read, you're a lens-based media student at the Peter Swartz Institute. What does yeah. that entail? And you know, what, is, what is the study about? Um, so that's my... Uh, I'm, I'm from Marseille, from uh, France. Um, and uh, uh, before that, I studied uh, sociology, uh, anthropology and film. Uh, and I had a long break. Uh, and I came back to study uh, in the Netherlands uh, at the Pittsburgh Institute in Rotterdam. That's the art school uh, where we can uh, experiment with uh, lens-based media or we can do uh, a lot of different things from film to photography um, and digital media. So it's uh, pretty... Uh, uh, I choose uh, to go there to really um, experiment. So like um, I said it um, earlier, like to really play with the cameras and the equipment in a, even breaking them sometimes. So mm. it's all about the mechanic. Yeah, so, and, and I think we, we quite well see that in your film. Um, we just saw an excerpt, but it starts off with yes. a very slow, slow motion view or slow view, and then it comes really wild and the perspective changes. Can you maybe, I mean, I was watching it and it was really nice to see kind of, meditative even and really nice nice images but can you maybe explain what i saw and what you did by manipulating the the film material uh sure um so overall this is part of a a, a research i'm doing on 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 continuity and fluidity this is kind of two thematic and i'm kind of uh, guiding uh, the work i'm doing uh, so how, for example, uh, the fluidity, uh, I'm using it as a guide as, uh, okay, can we describe the words today in uh, some fluid uh, manner sometimes? Uh, can we grasp uh, some characteristic of uh, today's um, uh, time or, or digital era through uh, fluidity or the way we feel sometimes? So, um, and so it starts from this kind of feelings of uh, always moving, uh, Kind of transient uh, atmosphere uh, nowadays and uncertainties and stabilities um, and then i'm trying to bring it to a more concrete things is okay how do we, we express this fluidity this uh, this world that is always moving always changing and it's not something new but i think it's an interesting feeling for me because it's linked with the feeling of freedom and there's an ambivalence to that uh, so how do you represent these feelings uh, throughout uh, an image uh, without representing uh, fluids, for example, without showing images of water or rivers or blood or other type of fluids. Um, so I attack it in a way through the mechanism of the camera, so the way we construct the images, because um, my idea was to see if by changing the way we build images, uh, whether it's photography or film, we can change the way we practice these images. Uh, and by practicing it, we create a new type of gestures. And this gesture may be uh, entailed to uh, the production of new metaphors. Uh, and in my case, the metaphor of fluidity. So I'm testing by changing the mechanic of the camera if I can represent or express this fluidity. Uh, in a concrete way, what I do is I'm doing shutterless photography. Uh, that is, I'm working against the fragmentation logic uh, that is within most of the cameras and most of the practice, whether you do film or whether you do photography, and even animation. Uh, and to break this fragmentation, there is one element in the cameras, uh, in the analog, the older camera or the film cameras, it will be a mechanical shutter. It's this part that closes and open and that control the, the light. Uh, so I take it out or I'm not using it. Um, so. Once you take this part out, that is kind of the symbolic representation of, of fragmentation, then you end up with light coming in all the time. Uh, and then you have to change the way you deal with light. So you have to expose your film in a different way. I choose to move the film away from the, from the light. Uh, a normal camera, you will press the button and it will take a picture really fast. Uh, and that way, by cutting the light, you will impact the depiction so you will show an image or like a figurate an object 
And so how do you do when you don't have this element that is actually the key element for figuration where you have to move it? And by moving the film, it is now the speed of the film that control the figuration. So if you want to show mm -hmm. an object, what we saw in the film, for example, it's an eight second photography. Uh, and I'm rolling the film while I'm in the train. So it's a kind of a traveling one image. Was it eight seconds? Yeah, when I have to reanimate it, because obviously you, and that's the whole thing about, I think the magic of cinema in general and this illusion of animation is the fact that photography, cinema is a type of photography and then you animate it. It's a sequence of images. But when you don't have this sequence anymore because you have a continuous image and it can be infinite, you could record forever. Well, you have to find a way to reanimate it. So that part of the, the work is not in line with the intention because you have to cut it down and you have to put it in the computer. So you see the limits of the technologies and you have to scan it, then you have to, the, the format doesn't fit. So when you look at, okay, I wanted to have a continuous image, but I have to cut it down to show it to you. And, mm. and I think that was a very interesting for me uh, also, that remind me the way we, we think sometimes, and we have to build categories, we have to build wall and borders and stuff to think and to contain, or, and that's, but I will keep this for later because I already talked a lot, <laughs> by cutting things together, that's also our way to animate things, to control life in general. Uh, so if you don't cut it, it's interesting. That's, mm. that's where I am. And sometimes you see, things in the film sometimes you don't and yeah. the key thing is if you see a little tree passing by in the film that means that tree at some point when it passed in front of the lens it was synchronized with the film speed so it was traveling at the same speed than me and this idea of synchronized uh, with your object or what you're filming is very interesting i think it's got some very um, um how do you say uh poetic, but also relational ideas. Uh, maybe it's also something that you, you feel when you work with an actor or an actress. So, this this, this yes, relationship you know. aspect of it is, is really interesting because I, I really liked just watching it and watching it of the fact that it's not really figuratively. Um, but then when this tree came by, I, I, I really liked it to have some, some point of yeah. Um, recognition. recognition. Yeah. And it was, it was maybe, it was, it sometimes even felt like some kind of expressionistic painting floating by. But I'm really wondering if you, before starting this project, if you knew what your film what would be, would gonna be like, if you have some kind of idea of, or is it just a result of experiment all the time with what you're doing? Um, I think it's around 12 years ago that I came up with this idea. Uh, I remember now because I'm writing about it. It's not just, uh, it, it was just a simple idea that I was, okay, I was doing a bit of photography, film photography, you know, I had my camera with me. Uh, and then I always wanted to link two images together. So these two frame. And this is like, uh, I mean, in theory of cinema and photography is a big thing, this in-between uh, images. But then there is a way to just connect them together. And I was interested to that. So I didn't realize that idea until now. And one of the reasons I came, um, not to the Netherlands, but to the pit spa, uh, was uh, to realize that idea, to actualize it. So how do you, you know, bridge things together? Um, the, my, I don't remember your question, I think. I get lost in the, uh, you were talking about figuration? No. How it was going to turn out. <laughs> Sorry. Technical. Is it a pure I'm... technical thing or, or was it like, is yeah, it? Yeah. So uh, it is, um, you, cannot, uh, you cannot plan because you take off the program of the camera. That means there's no more way to control the exposure or you have to uh, intuitively uh, think about these things. So, you have to intuitively, if you want to represent this tree, you have to intuitively think you're going at the same speed or you're reminding. 
So um, this is only possible in the in a train, right? No, it's uh, pos uh, most of the you thing is You have to have like, speed. Yeah, the train gave like uh, the film this kind of very linear. Uh, yeah. Um, and because the train are really stable, it also give a nice uh, uh, softness to it. Yeah. Uh, what you, you need to understand, uh, so to answer the question quickly, is like, no, you cannot plan what it is. But you can, you can think of it. And I think this is very interesting for me because it's like you create, it's, it's what we do when we look. Uh, mm -hmm. We create a vision. You know, we, we, we use our memory without even knowing it. And everything we see, we see it in a way that is constructed, whether culturally or physiologically. Um, so it's the same way. Now I'm constructing this idea of fluidity throughout the idea of continuity. Mm -hmm. Um, you almost understand now, I think, why you didn't use sound, because sound is also yeah. a way of cutting uh, your uh, awareness or your... So Can you maybe... If the image come in like the lights, then, no. the, then the sound would be distracting, I guess. Yeah. yeah. Can you maybe comment on, on that and on the fact that you didn't use sound? Yeah. So first, I'm also a big fan of cinema in general, and then... Uh, uh, probably going to do more film. I did my first film was a fiction film. So I, I, I quite uh, enjoy and I think it's a, still a very important uh, space, the cinema, uh, this dark room. Uh, um, and the film is really like uh, working in this room because uh, you focus on it. And then not having the sound first um, was very important because uh, like you notice, uh, the process is different. So you, I had to find uh, a way to produce the sound in the same kind of continuity or process. And that's, you know, you can find a lot of sound is way more continuous in a way than image than cinema. So it will, um, mm. so. But did you so, consider um, music or anything? I put some, uh, the, f the first test, I put a lot of like a kind of uh, experimental electronic uh, mm -hmm. atmospheric but then i quickly uh, dismiss it because uh, the sound carries too much uh, uh, meaning and yeah. that is this is so important they didn't have time too much to work on the sound at the time when i made the film um but also it actually once we went to it was in the cinema we were like whoa actually the, the impact of a silence film completely silent with no white noise whatsoever it's very uh, for me it was very scary in a way and it was very interesting because you can hear anybody mm. breathing um so that's your soundscape says the audience yeah uh, it's it's it, it, it's really funny because nowadays you really no, don't have this anymore especially because the cinema is equipped with this mm -hmm. spatial mm. high-tech uh, sound that completely overwhelm our yeah connection between audience you know the people who sit next to you and, and things like this yeah it makes me even more sad that we can't show this on the big screen yeah uh, unfortunately to make new ones <laughs> uh, so there is a question um, by someone um, could this style of Im imagery be presented in for example a still landscape photograph slash art piece I find the technique very intriguing. Uh, yes. So, I like always when you start uh, something and you think you discover something new, uh, we Google today, we quickly, uh, or other uh, platform, we quickly find out that we didn't invent anything really. Uh, so, there's a lot of uh, this technology or this technique, um, it's a refinement of strip photography. That is, means photography that uses the whole role of the film in one go uh, and it's uh, also kind of a, a like another type of slit scanning so this technology was kind of created at the same time that they invented photography the way we know it in the 19th century uh, so you actually uh, yeah the answer is yes uh, <laughs> the, the the work is a photographic work uh, so it's like mainly one image and then i had to cut it down to to reanimate it for the film uh, but the image is one long landscape yeah uh, 
and it's really interesting, but it's limited by the size of the film. Obviously, I'm not working with a big budget, but you could imagine then you could do kilometers and kilometers of the, 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 the film. It exists and simulated in digital. I have an application on my phone that do exactly the same that I tried to do for months uh, with my hands. Uh, and they do the same. There's a lot of your scanner at home do the same in a way. Not exactly the same because it breaks down the, the light. But um, So you could do uh, yeah, a lot of experiment. So. <laughs> Sounds great. And I think you, you're going to continue this experimenting uh, for a long time. And I'm uh, looking forward to see more of your work. Thanks. Um, for now, we have to continue to the third and last film um, due to the time, which is uh, En Route. And we have uh, director Marit Weerheim uh, here among us. Um, she graduated in 2016 and actually won an Oscar with her graduation film Grijs is ook een kleur, or When Grey is a Color. Um, en route premiered at the Netherlands Film Festival and won the, the main prize there, Golden Call for uh, Best Short Film. And in, in the film, we see two young siblings who go out with their father. And as viewers, we go along with the, with the games of the children and the slowing down of the trip. We, we, we will talk about that more uh, later. Um, but we don't really know what is happening. They, they, are, they have an objective, namely a sweet uh, dessert, but we don't really know. And then eventually we see that it's not as much fun as one would uh, think during the film. Um, I would assume that we're going to watch an excerpt now beforehand, and then we're going into the film. So here's the excerpt. Papa, this bread is echt heel erg droog. Neem een slok. Alex, niet snel drinken. Als je nog toe papa te laat kwam en toen we al die lekkere toetjes kregen. Ja? We gaan alles in slow motion doen. Kijk eens, vers brood. So uh, this is actually the moment also when they when they um, start this game of slowing uh, slowing it down the, the trip with their father. Can you maybe tell us how this film came about? And and let's just skip. I mean, spoiler alert. I, we have to talk about the film. So. Um, well, yeah, can you, can you tell us a little bit about the coming up of the idea for this film? Yes. Um, well, okay, so the spoiler is, I need to spoil the film, I'm sorry. The spoiler is they're going to the Food Bank, which is an institute in the Netherlands where people who live below the poverty line can uh, get some extra food from the government so that they can make it through the week. Um, and this all started when because I live across from one of these food banks. And I actually, I was very interested in what was happening there because I saw every Friday, I saw a lot of people there. And I was wondering what was going on. And I decided to go and work uh, for them. So I started working at the food bank. And I think the first time I was there, I, the, one of the things that struck me was, well, first of all, it was a very strange atmosphere because some people were very excited to be there because they saw their, uh, it was also a sort of social um, structure there. They saw friends and people they know they knew and also family members who met there. Um, but some people were very shy and wanted to go away as quickly as possible. And one of the things that struck me that first day was that there were a lot of sweet desserts left at the end. And one of the rules, there are actually two rules, and that is we need to get rid of all the food and it needs to be as, uh, we need to split it as, as fairly as possible. Um, but there were a lot of sweet desserts left 
And that was because a lot of people don't want like 14 packs of uh, pudding for one week because it's a lot of sugar and they want to want to stay healthy. Um, but it seemed because it was a, it, they, they were actually very luxurious chocolate desserts that were left over. And I thought this is like heaven for a child. So how must this how must this feel for a child to see and to be able to take that home with them? Um, and that was where, where the idea started. Yeah. So, but does that mean that, did you start working at the food bank because you had the idea of making a film or did the idea for the film came about after it? I think it went sort of hand in hand because as a filmmaker, I mean, as a person, I'm very curious to, to know everything around me. So I was very curious to this location, but of course i'm also a filmmaker so i'm always looking for stories to tell and for interesting stories to tell that we haven't seen before and also to um, sort of explore worlds that i don't know uh, myself or, or worlds that we don't see in the everyday life mm -hmm. so i think I, I definitely started there because i am a filmmaker and i want to find stories around me and this was in my neighborhood it was across the street so um it, it went hand in hand yeah yeah yeah, I can imagine. And um, I, I read somewhere in an interview that that you um, felt that you wrote this script really from your gut feeling, that it was really, really strong or something like that, if, if I may use that word. Can you maybe... Well, <laughs> um, uh, well, the thing is, I, I went to film school as a director, so I studied directing for four years. And then after I graduated, I was also interested in writing, but I never learned how to write. And this was actually my, I, I wrote one, I sort of co-wrote one short before, but then I decided I wanted to make a film about this. And I, I just, I wasn't sure if there was an actual story in this story. Like I, I had these children who wanted desserts and I had the food bank and I was just, I was looking if that was a story, if it was enough to, to, to make a film. Um, so I told my producers who were actually very enthusiastic, I told them, let me try and write something. Just let me try and put it on paper. And then I know if, if we need to start writing a script. So I wrote a script and then that was the script. And then that was, so, so it came within, like I wrote it in a couple of days because I was just testing out if it was something that I could make mm -hmm. and then it was made. So it, it came without thinking about rules of writing or I didn't know the rules of writing so I just went with what I felt was good and and I think it it read also as a for people reading it it, it must have felt like a director writing it because there was a lot of tiny details that that I knew I was gonna do on set but that a writer would never write down probably hmm. so that was the gut feeling that I was talking about yeah yeah all right I'm gonna check in if there's any question. No, not yet. Um, did Can you also? Question? Oh, maybe. <laughs> oh yes, of course. Yes, yes. Go ahead. Uh, um, I was just wondering. Um, so this perspective of of a child and a game and a child playing a game to go through something, which is a subject that I find very interesting because it's also telling yourself a story. Is it something that you, as a child, do you re do you recognize it from your own childhood? Oh, that's an interesting question. Um, I think I, I loved stories growing up and I had a lot of stories around me. I mean, I watched a lot of films and my parents took me to theater a lot. So I think I had quite an imagination, imaginative world around me. So I really liked making up stories. I also wrote stories, like horrible stories uh, when I was very young, but um, so I don't know if I made up stories to cover up like difficult feelings that I had, but I did make up a lot of stories and I loved playing with like stuffed animals until I was very old. So um, yeah, storytelling has always been one of my, my hobbies, I guess. Yeah. And how I, didn't, I, I did have a very good childhood, so I didn't have any like traumas to, to cover up with my own imagination. Hmm. Was that difficult for you to make a film w about uh, poverty uh, with a different kind of childhood pers perspective? Um, it wasn't really because uh, I 
sort of approach this film and these two children as if they didn't know they were poor. It mm-hmm. is actually at the end of the film where she realized for, realizes for the first time what their social status is and that they actually have to have the food bank, bank giving them food. Yeah. So I just approached these children as regular children, just wanting to play and wanting to have as much sugar as possible. That, um, that I can relate to really well because I, I loved sugar <laughs> growing up. So that was, that was very easy. Good. But I love making, um, actually made a film before when Grey is a Color that also has a child's perspective mm-hmm. uh, in a very difficult subject. And I love how children use their imaginative world to, to find answers in real life. And, um, and also because, like I said, I'm, I'm, me, myself, I'm, I'm very curious and these children can portray my curiosity to, to an audience. They can ask questions that I cannot ask and they, they can have entire worlds made up that I, that I have myself, I guess. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And, and how did you um, cast these young uh, actors uh, and, and how also was it to direct them? I, I love working with children. So I'm, I'm always very happy to start casting again because then I can like, see a hundred children and just play games with them. And um, so for this particular film, we started casting by just flyering all over. Um, first, I started flyering actually. I, there's, I think there's 12 food banks in Amsterdam and I worked at 10 of them, I think because I really wanted to get a feel of all the different uh, settings there. And also every neighborhood has their own food bank and they're completely different. So they all have their, their own structure. So I also went to all these food banks, not to just watch, but also to, to hand out flyers and to see if there were children who wanted to play in a film, because I felt that um, it is also, it, it, it's always good to talk with your, young actors about what the film is about Mm -hmm. so i thought it would be very interesting to have children who might have been through such a situation and also because then i would be able to provide them a very special uh, experience in acting in a film and maybe have some first experience with film in itself and culture and art and um, just maybe enrich their lives in a little bit but uh, the kids there were very hesitant to participating. And also um, a lot of parents didn't really want their children to be in such a film, Mm -hmm. which I completely understood. So I started looking in in other places, flyering at soccer clubs and stuff like that. So, um, and then I just, kids send in a video and they get selected or not. And then I have a lot of castings. where I do a set of different games and, and exercises and um, improvisation. Mm-hmm. And then these two really stuck out and they were amazing. And then for on set, I mean, I just, I try to make them as comfortable as possible because they really need to be able to say everything to me, especially, especially to me because I'm the one who's telling them what to do. So they need to feel comfortable and they can ask questions and, they have the time to experiment and they can always improvise and they're very free. Um, and I also try to make a setting where they feel, oh, this is my character. Mm. So I try to introduce them in their house and then walk around before shooting. And we just walk around and we have pictures in the house that has their face on, on them. So, and I also, for this film, I made pictures of the kids and the dad together as a family. So we had family pictures who were already in the house when they got there for the first time. So I try to create such atmosphere that they just understand who they are and um, who they're playing. And they just like, um, I think I think children really like to not be underestimated. So I like to approach them as tiny adults and then, and then um, just ask a lot of them and then they feel very responsible for the whole thing. Well, yeah, I, I think you really did a great job in uh, also portraying an, an atmosphere in which in which it really it feels real. It feels happening. What what you see on the screen, and it really really feels warm. Also, 
Um, was there a lot of improvisation, imp improvisation actually, or was it all scripted? Um, there is there are one or two scenes that were very scripted because I just had to have some information in the film, like what they were going to do. That, so the scene we just saw where they were on the breakfast table that was written, but they also were very free to like add words or do things in between. Um, and there are a few scenes that I just had one sentence in the script. Um, for example, there is a scene in the subway where they play a game. Mm -hmm. And the, in the script, it was just the kids play a game with their dad because she can delay within the subway and he can't uh, rush. So they're stuck in the subway and this is the time where they can just be a happy family. Um, so, and then I just, we kept on rolling for, I think we did like maybe 30 minutes going up and down with the subway and they were just playing games and we just took like a little bit, like the, the best bit. So it was a combination of improvisation and script. Hmm. But I always, I, I, I don't try, I try not to give lines to the kids before we start shooting because then they start practicing in, in the mirror. So I, I never actually give the lines to the kids. So they didn't know what they were going to say until like a few minutes before we started shooting. Yeah. I, I was also thinking about the end because I watched it again this afternoon and the, the end just makes me cry again when I see it. But what, what does the end say also maybe about you? Because the, the, it, it really ends also on, on an optimistic note. On the, on the one hand, you have the realization of her about her, uh, what, what you said also, her status, her social status. But on the other end, you also see the father getting food from other people um, who also really need that food. And this is really strong feeling. And I, I don't know, what, do you have some kind of an, an optimistic worldview or is there <laughs> you, Marit, as a uh, philanthropist uh, in, in that scene or something? or? Um, well, this is this is just my experience from working at the food bank. Actually, I, I'd say like ninety five percent of people coming there are so generous and are very grateful that they get food, and it's all for free, and they only have to prove that they need it, and then they can get their food. And so a lot of people are are really grateful and and share as well. Mm. Um, so this was just my experience and um, I, I felt that that was definitely a part of the story yeah. um, because the, the whole atmosphere there keeps surprising me. And um, yeah, so I, but I'm, I'm a very positive person when it comes to world problems. Um, uh, but it was also very important that she saw what was going on there. She's observing what the whole situation is and she's learning for the first time in her life that her actions have consequences. Yeah. So that's why she also uh, runs towards her father at the end, just because she has grown a little bit. It's just, it's a tiny coming of age story where she understands that whatever she does has effect on her family as well. And also, I think it's a really beautiful moment that you see your father as a person. That's a really powerful moment for a child when you see your father and he is like he is having a problem. I know you do it in other films as well that you have this father and then he is he has to deal with the situation. And, and yeah, I, I love the way I just that that's for me really. I recognize it as a child that you suddenly you see your f mother and father and you think, oh, you are you are, you have a people. <laughs> They're people, frustrated people. Yeah. Yeah, I, yeah I, love, I love the combination of this imaginative world and, and hardcore reality. Um, that's also why the film begins when it's still dark. Um, and then slowly it, it gets light. And in the end, it's like broad daylight, mm -hmm. uh, which is very realistic. But before, before they reach the food bank, it's still like sort of sh shimmering and yeah. sort of romantic light. So... Um, her world goes from from uh, fantasy to reality. Oh, so you had a really light thing in the film as well because you're shooting in, in the magic hour in the morning and then you have to be all the time like, no, it's too much light now. We have to. We did, yeah. Right. But you have two magic hours a day, so we did. Ah, of course, you can use the evening as well. Yeah. <laughs> Very nice. There's actually also the, the location matter, which we talked also with Natalie about. Because is this a, a real food bank? And if so, was it how, how was it difficult to shoot at this location? 
It is actually a real food bank. It is not the one that I that I work at because that one is, I must say, very ugly from the inside. Um, but this one was actually, it's also a church because mm -hmm. most food banks, uh, they don't have their own building. It's also something else. So mine is also a, I don't know how to say that, uh, like a community house. And then there's the food bank every Friday. So this was actually a church. You didn't see that in the film, but on this on one side is a church. And then you have the part where they do like meetings and screenings of films and food banks and um but we didn't shoot while the food bank was uh going so all the crates and all the stuff we put in because they didn't want of course us to film when there were people who were actually going to the food bank uh, would be there so um we had the whole location to ourselves and uh, because i went there when there was an actual food bank going on uh, i knew how they how they used to stack their crates and how they would use the space. So we just recreated uh, that same situation um, at our convenience. Mm. Actually, there were a few uh, extras who are at the end who did go, who are actually clients of the food bank. Oh, wow. um, of the one that I worked uh, work at, um, because a lot of people knew that I was making the film. I talked to a lot of people about it where I work and um they all really liked it so some of them wanted to be an extra that's great yeah yeah i'm just in the meantime saying real quick that rivka had an internet problem and that's why she disappeared okay he's like sending me a message i'm sorry it doesn't work <laughs> so just so you know <laughs> she's uh, she's been uh, forgiven <laughs> um i actually think we have to conclude because our, we are even a bit over time already but um I really enjoyed it. I hope you did too. Thank you very much to all the guests who've been here. I really appreciate your presence and your willingness also to answer our questions. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, for the for the viewers, um, don't forget if you didn't register already for our uh, online platform, uh, please do so. It is available until the third of uh, May, so you have some days left uh, to watch all our films. Uh, in addition. Tomorrow and next week, two evenings, we have uh, more Q&A sessions like these with, uh, with filmmakers. Uh, tomorrow evening, we also have an online party to be streamed. And Saturday, we have a film quiz planned. So that's uh, quite some uh, program uh, for the upcoming days. Thank you very much for being here. Enjoy the evening and cheers. <laughs>